I have a blog. Um, okay, so I have a blog that turned into a book. Uh, and uh, I guess to begin for those people that, that may not have an understanding of, of the background of Whole Lot of Love, uh, by the way, this is just some eye candy. So there's, you know, there's, I'm not talking off the slides. They're just there for you to look at. Um, I, had a, I had a blog, I have a blog, um, and it, it basically was um, me documenting what I was doing in regards to food and, more importantly, lifestyle. And uh, obviously that turned into a book, which I never imagined would happen. It was never part of the plan. It actually just, you know, kind of arrived one day. There was an email that said, you know, we love what you do. Can you please write us a book? And, uh, and as I tell many people, I deleted the email because I thought it was spam. <laughs> and uh, I just didn't get down, scroll down to where it said we're a Nigerian publishing house. Um, so uh, that's um, that, that's pretty much the story. But I guess it's not when people say that I'm a food blogger. I kind of it's not like I get pissed off about that. But I'm definitely not a foodie. I think you know there's there's a very very clear distinction between appreciating and loving food for the sake of loving food. Whereas I think my story is a little bit more about the story itself behind the food and the reasons why I do what I do in regards to food. And I ate at, at a really nice restaurant last night, um, Matt Wilkinson's restaurant, and the food was amazing. And I'm always really impressed when I go out to restaurants because I don't get out very often because I live in the country. Um, and that to me is absolutely, you know, the pinnacle of really, really nice food, a kind of a marriage of, of classy chef action and some ethics behind the food. Okay, so my food story kind of started with, well, in fact, it was, it's pretty boring. Um, I used to do a lot of things that would probably disgust you, and, and they disgusted me, and, and that's, they're the cat, there's a whole lot of catalysts that change the way I view food and the way I treat food. And there's four main catalysts that I talk about. The first one was I was working five days a week as a designer, and I was working a, a day, a, a Saturday, um, as a wedding. Any any wedding photographers out there? Good. Don't. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was about to say something really mean. I hope you like your job because I hated it. Um, and I was very, very busy, and so busy that I kind of used it as, as an excuse. I have two girls. You've probably seen some photos up there of my two beautiful daughters. And I used being really, really busy as an excuse to feed them pretty crap food. And I'm talking about the easiest stuff I could get in the supermarket, which was the packets of frozen chicken nuggets, um, crumbed chicken breasts, you know, um, frozen fries, frozen vegetables, anything that I could just press buttons, you know, turn dials and feed the kids really, really quickly. And that was the, every time I, every time I put that food on the plate for the kids, I realised there was something wrong with that food. It wasn't the food that I was fed when I was a kid. I knew how processed it was. I knew somebody else was making it for me and I was me merely reheating it. And I guess that was the first catalyst for me to say, Rowan, you've got to be a better parent. And parents, we have guilt. We're riddled with guilt. Are we doing a good enough job? Because there's no bloody handbook. Um, and, and so that was the first catalyst for me was looking at that and saying, right, I've got to make some changes with the food. The second main catalyst for me was walking into my doctor's office and he said, Ro, this is really embarrassing. He said, you'll be dead by the time you're 40. You've got, you got high blood pressure, you've got high cholesterol, you've got anxiety, you've got depression and you're overweight. And that was because I was working so hard, I was unhappy in my job which made me depressed, and it was a full cycle of doing all the things that we know we shouldn't do, 
Um, and that was a big kick up the butt for me. You know, uh, very, very, very much so was if, if I don't make some changes in my life, not just regards to food, but it was regards to lifestyle, then there's going to be some consequences. And I think I was in my early 30s at the time, and that kind of stuck in my mind. I, di I didn't come out of the doctor's office and, and, have, and have this kind of, you know, epiphany and say, you know, I'm going to start a blog and change the way I do food. It was just one of those things in the back of my mind. Um, I did really... I did walk out there and say, I've got to contact that Nigerian publishing house. <laughs> <clears throat> the, the, next, the next catalyst for me was reading and understanding the environmental implications of the food that I was eating. And I go on about this all the time, and I know it gives everyone the shits, but I don't care, because we need to have an understanding of everything that we eat. Everything that we eat has some sort of environmental implication. And I was the, I was the biggest culprit. I was the one that was buying the chicken nuggets in the packet. And, and I, I, would do, I would start to do research and break down every single meal that I was eating. And the further I investigated and thought about the effort that was involved in that food production system, the more pissed off I got with myself because I was one of the biggest contributors. So let's consider stuff like, um, okay, frozen vegetables, for example. In Australia, where I live, where in, oh God, I've just been, I've just been in America, can you tell? Um, Victoria, Australia, it's down the bottom, okay? It's actually colder down there, not warmer down there, okay? So it's kind of like got a climate like Oregon, okay? Um, so, where was I? Vegetables, okay? So, in Western Victoria, you go to an agricultural farm shop, right? And you buy all your seeds and you buy all your chemicals, because we love chemicals in the country. You can get now, vegetable seeds come Roundup ready. Does anyone know what that means? They're coated with glyphosate already. They're already coated. So a seed, even before the bloody things germinated in the ground, it's already covered in some sort of a poisonous chemical. Now, I say, people say, oh, yeah, but, you know, you'll get a better yield per hectare. I'm not a farmer, by the way. This is when I have conversations with people. You'll have a better yield per hectare if, if you know, because you can outcompete the other weeds. And I say, would you put it on your kids' wheat bix for breakfast? No. Well, it's, it's in our food. Straight away, our food system is already poisoned from the beginning. And that concerns me. That concerns, you know, for the health of my kids and the health, the residual chemical that's left in the soil. I mean, th that's only the beginning of the problem. Then consider the stuff like all the petrol that is used for... I see it every day, huge machinery. I, got, took, I took a photo, I've got to put it on Instagram. The other day, I was stuck in um, Dean traffic near Dalesford, which was um, uh, a wide tractor... With a, with a plower so wide that it had to have a car in the front and a car behind with flashing lights because it was moving from one paddock to another. It's so wide, it takes up two lanes. That thing just runs on diesel. It's just like chugging up all that diesel juice. So consi consider all the environmental, you know, the carbon emissions from the food production system that's so massive because we all rely on other people to grow our food for us. Then I started thinking about the packaging of the chicken nuggets. So, you know, you think about the paper and the plastic, the ink, even the metal for the tin soup. All that stuff takes a lot of energy to create, every little bit that we have. And then that gets thrown out and it goes back into landfill. But that's that plastic, even the plastic is rubbish. That's a concern. But considering the amount of energy and effort and, and, and crap that's going into the air to make the plastic in the first place, I mean, it's just horrendous. The more I think, thought about it, the more depressed I got about it. And then I just kind of figured, you know what? I'm going to take myself out of the system. Somehow, I'm going to reduce my negative impact. Now, how do I do that? Well, now I do that whole thing, grow, gather, hunt, cook. And I know that's such a large, extreme way to kind of to, to make some sort of a change. But I had to do something. That was, that was my opinion. That was my op only option, sorry. Now... The last catalyst for me to make some change was, like I said, I was working six days a week. I was absolutely flat out like a lizard drinking. I say that in America and they go, oh yeah, awesome, Australian. <laughs> and and uh, so with that, I mean, okay, so I'm going to do something here and, and don't be shy. You, who's going to work after this? <laughs> okay, so who really, really, really really is excited about going to work and just loves working. Oh. Okay, well, look, we've got like six people there, right? 
I was in that place. I was in that place. I've worked for like some of the worst companies in the world, Coles, Meyer. Mm. And, you know, I've worked for a couple of other big companies. I've worked for state government. And, you know, the last job I had, this design job for state government, I, I, I was in a tiny little cubicle, no music, <laughs> seriously, like no posters, no nothing, no fun. Like, they didn't even have bad Hawaiian shirt Fridays. I mean, <laughs> there, was no, there was no joy at all. And I had that for seven years. I was going mad. Plus, the deadlines were horrible. There was no, there was no passion. And so, in my life... There was nothing, I wasn't challenging myself here and there was bugger all happening here. And that, that kind of was happening in regards to food as well. The more I kind of analyse it, okay, so think about this. You're walking in the supermarket shelf. We're doing this, right? We're grabbing stuff off the shelf. And then we walk and then, you know, there's some pimpled faced person in there that says, hi, how's your day been? And they do the small talk, which I hate because I, I, I just can't stand that bullshit small talk. And then you get frustrated by that situation, then you hand the money, and then they give you the food, and you, you take it home, and you drive home, and then you pop it in your... Oh, so unprofessional. Unbelievable. There you go. Well... So you go home, you take your chicken nuggets out of the plastic bag, you pop them in the oven or the microwave, you press go. There's no... There's no connection with your food. Now, the alternative for me is I go out into the backyard, I pull vegetables out, I look at them, I look at all the effort that has gone into that vegetable. I cook it, I taste the sugars in the vegetables. Amazing, Sh sugars are in vegetables. Um, and and I, I communicate with people that are growing or raising animals. There's a connection with the food. You don't get that with Gary pressing the buttons at the, serve, at the counter at the Coles supermarket. There's no connection. And that's something intrinsically spiritual, spiritually beneficial about being more involved with your food production as opposed to, you know, just buying the packet of chicken nuggets and driving home. Now, with all these changes that I've made, there's been some amazing benefits, uh, like absolutely amazing benefits. And, and just the same in the same way that I never considered to write a book or never considered to tour America, um, I, I never considered all these amazing benefits to kind of occur. There's, there's quite a few um, benefits. The first one I want to talk about is, is a food community. Now, in the old days, I would go to the supermarket and buy my food. Now, as you know, if you read my blog, you'll see that I'll either, I'll either grow or, or I'll hunt food or I'll trade it with other people or I'll work for food. So where people are too busy in their office jobs and they have an orchard in their backyard, I'll go prune it, pick the fruit, um, and I get paid in food. Or um, somebody who doesn't have a rifle, really loves a rabbit, I'll shoot some rabbits for them and trade them for some food. Um, so this food community over the last couple of years has developed into something that we don't sit down on Fridays and take minutes and, you know, we don't have a chairman and all that type of stuff, although I'd be a rad chairman. Um, we, it's more of a loose kind of... A lot of people in my food community don't know each other, OK? So there'll be... I've got this mate of mine, Greg, and, and he'll rock up. He rocked up the other day. We went mushroom picking. And he said uh, he had some... He cooked a pig, a whole pig and he had lots of bits left over, and he said, do you want to use it for soups? That's my food community. He's like, he's got leftovers, and we're swapping it. Now, this stuff happens all over the world, where people are sharing stuff, sharing food, because we, you know, they don't necessarily have the cash to go splurge on stuff. And I love that whole concept of people sharing, not necessarily to get anything back in return, but everyone's... People seem to share, and as soon as you open yourself up to the concept of it... OK, so... Let's have a show of hands. Does anybody grow any veggies in the, on their veranda or their, their backyard or anything like that, right? Okay, now, I can guarantee you, you've had too much of something at some stage and you've probably gifted it to somebody and then in return, they've given you something back. I love those stories where, you know, you give zucchini to somebody because, I mean, let's face it, everyone grows too much zucchini and they'll give you back somebody... In return, they'll give you back a relish, you know, or a, a zucchini quiche or something like that. That's my food community, that sharing. You don't get that with Gary at the checkout at Coles. And because you don't get that, you, you don't get that spiritual nourishment, and that's one of the... But now that I have this food community, I have that spiritual nourishment 
And I, I know it sounds a really, you know, for a bearded guy that looks like a redneck, <laughs> that it is a real hippie kind of, you know, I, I appreciate it like a, like a hippie because it, it really just, at the end of the day, I feel joy that I've got this family of people that kind of give a shit about life. Another amazing benefit too, I guess, is the fact that when I was in an office, and sorry for everyone that's working in an office, and I'm going to go walk in the forest and pick some mushrooms with my daughter after this talk, so I do apologise for that. <clears throat> um, but now that I do, everything that I do seems to have some sort of direct benefit. And there's a book by Angelo Pellegrini called The Unprejudiced Palette. Has anyone read that book? I urge you to go, go on, <laughs> we're going to blow up, um, what's that, what's that um, website where they sell the, Amazon. Let's blow up Amazon, right? 9.95, right? Everyone go buy it today. It's, it's an amazing book. It's written in 1948 by an Italian immigrant going to America, seeing how buggered their food system was. 1948? Hello? Anyone listening? 1948, this guy talks about the problems of the food system in America in 1940s, where people just walk up to diners, get crap food, walk out, and they're like robots. This guy talks about the passion of doing things for food, doing things for life, enjoying homemade wine, enjoying homemade grown vegetables and home-cooked food. Um, and, and he also talks about that the beauty of doing things and getting something in return for it in regards to your effort. So in the old days for me, when I was reading this book, I was going into an office and every fortnight I'd get paid a large sum of money and then I'd go to that money and I'd wave around and give it to other people that would give me things in return. Now I have this amazing process where if I'm cold, I go out and chop some wood and I start a fire and it gets me warm. It's amazing. Instead of paying somebody, the gas company, to press a button and then the gas comes out and I get really warm in an instant, now, I mean, I know it's a pain in the ass to go out and chop wood and I'm not saying that everyone has to go out and chop wood so there'll be no trees left, so don't do it. But the, the point I'm trying to make is I get some sort of amazing benefit from now doing everything that gives me some direct return. If I go fishing for a trout, I get to eat a trout, and it's a real treat, as opposed to reading a Jamie Oliver cookbook, no offence, Jamie, and going and saying, oh, trout and asparagus dish. I'll go down to Coles, buy a whole trout and some asparagus from Peru. Hello, wrong. There's no love, there's no passion in that. When you go out and you do the, make the effort yourself, there is amazing passion and, um, and, and this spiritual connection with your food. And that's been one of the things I never expected to happen. I, you know, a lot, a lot of my main driver was environmental, you know, um, environmental uh, reducing my impact on the environment. But all these amazing things, these like spiritual nourishment stuff has happened. And it's actually started making me question everything else in an annoying way. If you ever read my blog, you'd, you'd see how philosophically annoying I am. Um, but in st I'm thinking now, I'm now thinking about everything, and it's not just about food, it's about a lifestyle. And that's something that when I run these workshops um, up near Dalesford, um, I explain to people that this is a skills-based workshop. Very, very strictly speaking, it's me telling you these are the skills that I've learned, I'm sharing them with you. But what inevitably, inevitably comes out of it is people walk away inspired to change their life. And whether or not that's just to go to a farmer's market and to talk to the farmer about, you know, the, the, the produce, to have a direct connection with their food, that's a positive change. And that, that's a good segue, actually, to, the, to one of the most amazing, enjoyable things about uh, the side effects of the whole Lada Love process, is running these workshops and there's been a couple of times where some amazing things have happened. I, I teach people stuff like how to forage for wild mushrooms, how to do fly fishing, how to clean a rifle, um, you know, how to kill a chicken, how to skin a rabbit. If anyone wants to come along these workshops, it's um, www.holololove.com. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but the, the idea is that people want to have an idea of where their food comes from. They want to learn some new skills, okay? So one of them is, is, is um, killing a chicken. How much time have I got? Five, okay, this is good. I've got the chicken killing story. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so what we do is we teach people how to eat. So who eats chicken? Hands up. Okay, who's held a live chicken? Well, that's pretty good. What school did you go to? Uh, who's killed a chicken? Okay, right, that's what I want to see. Okay, so a lot of people come because they want to have an understanding of the process involved in killing a chicken. So what we do is, because a lot of people haven't actually held a live chicken in their life, I hand the chicken around to everybody. 
And there's two sneaky reasons for this. One, I want to teach people how to hold the chicken from a technical standpoint. I don't want them to let go of the chicken. Because if you let go of a chicken when it's about to get killed, they know. <laughs> and they run. And you, and you get stressed and the bird gets stressed and it's not an enjoyable experience. The whole point of the process is to make it as clean and efficient as possible. The other sneaky reason is I want people to have a connection. Now, this is the hippie inside the redneck again, okay? I want people to have some sort of connection with that beating heart, that animal, that feathered animal that's lived a life, is making noises, is breathing, and people en end up doing that, especially girls. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble for being sexist. Mostly girls, sometimes guys. Well, oh, it's so cute. You're so cool. It's so fluffy, beautiful. Blah, blah, blah. What happens is there is some sort of a connection, which is very important because it's very important to have an understanding that that is a living beast. You're going to take that, that living beast's life to get that energy to nourish you. Then what we do is to kill them, we put them in a killing cone, we pop the head out, and I teach people, find the jugular, we cut the neck, uh, we, we cut the jugular and break the neck. And there's, a, there's a photo up there, I know, I see you, sorry, honey. Yeah, it's not your neck, darling. <laughs> but that's the process. Now, if you saw that happen, we do one at a time, and, and people have a real connection with, with that process. You imagine that at a factory. That's bang, 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 bang. It's disgusting. So what, what happens is, the, the, the bird flaps around. There was a photo back there with loads of blood. You would have seen it. That's the reality of meat. And then we hang them up. Uh, we, we, sorry, we put them in some scalding hot water, the birds. It helps loosen the feathers. Um, I'm giving you a free lesson here, by the way. Uh, we, we, hot, we hang it up, and I usually get people to work in pairs. And there's, a, there's a little, another sneaky reason. I'm full of sneaky reasons. Very dodgy bloke. And the reason being is two people working on, on a chook will um, get it done, the, done, the job done twice as fast. But also, the sneaky reason that I, I get people to work in pairs, they start talking to each other. And they start saying stuff. You know, you hear in the, in the background, people say, oh, I didn't realise that process would be so bloody or, or not so bloody or um, I, I can't believe I've just killed an animal. You know, there's all that conversation. Now, as there's that conversation, people are p pulling all the feathers off. And the more, more and more feathers that come off, all these things start to appear that they're so used to seeing, like chicken wings, chicken drumsticks, and it's food. It's like, oh, barbecue, barbecue, chicken drumsticks, oh, <laughs> buffalo wings, oh. And, you know, they, it's turned from this thing they were holding, like this living animal, into something that becomes food. And we don't get that experience. We've missed a couple of generations of that, and that really sucks. Because we, we have missed that because we've got this food system now that just caters for us. And we've got people like Rowan Anderson buying chicken nuggets for his kids five years ago. That just that make that clear. I don't buy them anymore. So that's a very, very valuable experience for someone to have that. It's they have a connection with their food. And I know that sounds really wanky in a way, but it's very, very important because it changes the way that person views food for the rest of their lives. And so far are we removed from our food. We had this instance a couple of weeks ago where one of the participants, we got to the stage where we're gonna pull the guts out. So we cut around the cloaca, put your hands up there and pull out the guts. And I teach people to kind of put their hand in there and grab it, squish it around a little bit, make sure you get it all, pull it all out at once. And she looks at it, she's holding the chicken with that hand and the lady, and she's, she's got all the guts in there. She's like, oh fuck, there's an egg. There's an egg, what the fuck is this egg doing in the chicken? <laughs> There was a fully formed egg in the chicken. Everyone's just looking at her. Like you just said, what is an egg doing in a chicken? And it was just an amazing moment where, you know, there's that fully formed egg. She would have probably popped that out the next day if we hadn't chopped her head off. And, and, the, and she's like, well, she's just staring at it. And then she said, can I eat it? And it was covered in guts and I said, sure, no dramas. You wash it, you can eat it. And then as the afternoon progressed, more and more eggs came out. Not not a lot more people said, fuck, there's an egg in the chicken. <laughs> we washed them all and they ate them for breakfast the next day. Now, you tell me that's not a journey, a food journey, an adventure in discovering the reality of food. So much so that you've gone from like never killing a chicken, never holding a chicken, to killing, butchering, pulling a chicken out of the guts and then eating it for breakfast. Now that's extreme, I know, in a way, and not everybody gets to experience that. But that person now, has a, walks away from the workshop saying, you know what, mm, 
I'm not even sure I could buy organic free-range Lilydale chickens anymore because I've done some, you know, I, you know, it just doesn't seem right. And they start thinking about food and then that person forever has a better understanding of the crap processes that are involved and then in, in, in turn starts making better decisions in regards to food. Well, I think that's all I've got time for now. I'll probably rabbit it on too long. Rabbit, get it. I like rabbit. <laughs> Let's give her a hand. We have about five minutes left for some Q&A, so yeah, if anyone has some questions, just shout them out and I'll cut you off in about five, six minutes. Yeah. Go, ask away. Now this is, when I was in America, I'd say, well look, I'm not in Philadelphia very often, so you may as well ask some questions. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Do you think there's a, 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 I mean, a formula or a system that can be put into place into urban spaces such as Richmond or... Yep, definitely. Yep. And you know what that is? That's you, right? You, you, you go out there. I spoke to a bloke yesterday that lives in, um, in Melbourne and he said he's contacting the Stonning, Stonnington Council. Uh, I think that manage the train, the, the crown land that's on the train lines and there's so much land He's contacting the council. He said, I've got no space to go veggies. But he's contacting the council um, to see whether or not the, manage, the area that they manage pretty poorly, it's just like long strips of land, can we plant veggies in there? So it's up to, it's up to you guys to do it. I mean, we know the options that are out there. There's farmers markets, there's community gardens. And look, the community gardens concept in Melbourne sucks because there's waiting lists, it's expensive, there's not enough land. You know, there's, there's a whole lot of other alternatives out there. I didn't have enough land. When I wrote that book, I had a very, very small backyard. So I called up a, a friend of a friend who had like nine acres. And I said, can I rent some soil? The concept of renting soil off people to grow vegetables. Now I know there's backyards that are doing bugger all in Melbourne. And they might be your neighbour's place or whatever. You knock on the door and say, g'day mate, do you mind if I plant, you know, how's this concept? I want to grow some vegetables, I've got no land, I'll give you some vegetables. I mean, that, that, that concept's been existing in places like Italy and Spain forever. Um, and and they, they also, it, in, in Italy, you get a train trip through Italy um, and countryside, you'll see all these spots along the train lines where people are renting um, land off the government to grow their little veggies because they live in apartments. It's about us. It's, it's about us making choices and investigating alternatives. Um, I have a friend over here, Fran, who has a tiny patio. Her veggies, I get goosebumps for this, her veggies, she kicks my ass in regards to tomato plants every summer. She has a worm farm on a veranda. I don't even have a worm farm. She's got a worm farm with like super worm champagne. She puts on the tomato plants, they get full sun. She waters them, she captures the water in a shower. She, didn't, she doesn't have to do that, but that's where she gets her veggies, a lot of her veggies from in, in summer. I mean, that's a beautiful, that's her, that's her initiative. And I think it's, I think instead of, and no offence to you, it's not a matter of there being one set answer. It's about us finding the answers for ourselves. It's like me going to the higher place and hiring the jackhammer and jacking up the concrete in my backyard and turning it into a vegetable garden. I didn't have to do that, but I wanted, I, wanted, I wanted those vegetables in there. I wanted to make a difference in my family's life. So I think it's up to us. Any other questions? Someone over here? Yeah. Do you have bees? Bees. I hate bees. I mean, I love bees for what they do, but all my bee friends are like real, those tough bee guys, right? And they kind of like come up to the hive and they're not wearing anything and they're kind of like, yeah, you know, like they're, they're pretty friendly, but don't worry about it. They're friendly bees. You might get bit a couple of times, you know. I got bit as a kid and I do not like bees. Um, but, but the thing is, I don't do bees. I don't make my own wine, my own beer. I don't have cows. I don't have sheep. I don't have goats. I don't have pigs. But I have this food community of people that I've developed and they all have little bits and pieces of that so I can do trades with them. And I think that's the thing as well is you can't do everything. We just can't. There's not enough time of the day, especially if you're working five days a week, suckers. So the thing is we need to work together. That's how we got to this point in time anyway, how we've got buildings and cars and trains and aeroplanes. We work together as ants to, for one big cause. That's the same thing that we need to do with food is to share with people that are, are doing bees. Time for one more quick question, if there is one. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Um, since you've just been over touring around the States, I'd just be interested to hear like the overall perception was of where Australia is at in general with the movement towards local and growing 
Yep. Yeah, I, I think that there's a... We have some very similar problems between America and Australia, and, and they have some really extreme problems, and so they've got some really ex extreme kind of approaches. I've seen some beautiful things in America which, which are really inspiring. There was one place in Texas um, where a, 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 a landscape gardener had five acres pretty much in downtown Austin, and he just kind of had this epiphany moment, um, and he decided he wanted to grow food for people. So he ripped up his where all the tractors were parking and all that stuff and his piles of gravel, dug it all up about two or three years ago. They have the most amazing produce um, there that they, they sell at a little stand, you know, and, and it's all seasonal and it's, it's just everything they grow there. They don't buy anything else in. And I love those, those concepts and they, have, they also have um, really great kind of uh, community educational gardens. So uh, I got off the plane in uh, Birmingham, Alabama and... Um, there was uh, straight off to um, about 20 or 30 um, uh, poor, and I'll say this, poor black kids um, that I did a talk to. Um, and th this is a, there's a real black and white problem in Birmingham, Alabama, um, and these guys all volunteer to have this beautiful garden set up to teach the kids this is where food comes from and this is good food as opposed to KFC and all that stuff. So they've got some really extreme approaches to... to Whereas we've got like series and a couple other bits and pieces and we've got the Abbotsford Farmers Market, I know that. Um, the thing I've noticed is we have similar problems, some similar solutions, the scale is still shithouse. We don't, it's not big enough. You walk into a Coles supermarket and a Safeway and there's the majority of Australians in there, okay? So we've got a small group of people here that are kind of in, possibly interested in the whole food problem but it's a bigger picture thing. We need, it, we need more. What we have is just not enough. And I think even though the, the problems and solutions things, the similarities between Australia and the US uh, exist, oh, I would just love to see more and more people. There's a lot of rich people in there that have land that could be helping people in the community that don't have land. I mean, there's just, there's so much more to do. And I guess that's, I've kind of come back with, I haven't written a blog post for a while because my mind's kind of like digesting the trip. But I want to do more. I want to get a message out there that is clear to people that we need to do something because, like, even for my catalysts, the benefits that have come out of it, um, even, from a, even from a perspective of as soon as petrol gets up to, like, $5 a litre, and trust me, it's going to happen at some stage, what are our alternatives to get our food from Queensland and New South Wales and from Mildura? How are we going to get that food down to Melbourne? That's going to be a real challenge for us or our children um, and uh, I think that's a really, really scary thing. And there's some Americans that realise that and there's some Australians that realise that. But it's, it's really up to us now. To, because the thing is, all of us are the ones that control it. We control the system. It's in our back pocket. So every single dollar that we spend, we, we're like voting with our money. So that, that's, the, that's the only alternative for us. Thanks very much, Ryan. No worries. Thank you. Thank you.